Hi, Finlay. How are you? I'm very good. How are you? I'm okay. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. Um, what are you doing for the lockdown these days? <laughs> um, do you know, I started off, I think I started off like everyone did, like just sort of going on walks and watching films and stuff. Mm. And more recently, I've been trying to get back into like, um, I know, I've been trying to have like, I've been trying to have a fun summer. So I've been getting, uh, been getting drunk with my friends. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So uh, are things getting a little bit, you can meet up with people now and stuff. That's but right. Why are you you couldn't do that, yeah. Yeah, I've been going. I've been going to hang with my cousin. I've been. My cousin lives in Oxford, so I've been going to stay with him. He's a lot uh, of fun. All right, cool. Um, all right, well, thanks for coming on the Need to Know Comedy Show. Uh, yeah. You were recommended by Patrick Healy. He's a mate of yours, is he? Or yeah, yeah, such a funny guy. Yeah, he's, he, he, he's really cool. Yeah. And um, so last year you won the the uh, so you think you're funny competition. No? I I was lucky enough to yeah. That's amazing. Like, how long have you been doing comedy? Um, okay, so it's a, it's a weird one because I, I did my first gig a long time ago. I did my first gig when I was seven. Uh, seven. And then, yeah, when I was seven, I, I, was, I, did, I did something called the Comedy Club for Kids, um, which is, I don't know if, you, if you, you've heard of it. It's like uh, we do like daytime shows for younger audiences, like anywhere from like six to uh, like 11. Mm -hmm. uh years old and uh it's like you know kid friendly shows so no swearing mm -hmm. um and uh you get kids as acts as well i mean you get you know proper big comedians as well like i've met so many uh comedians who like went on to to be really big from doing that uh yeah. like james acast used to do it phil wang used to do it uh oh. loads of people but um i think Stuart lee did it once and uh yeah, it, it was, it was, I, I did it sort of on and off mm. for, for a while and then sort of school got in the way. So I didn't do it for a long time. And then, um, and then I, in my first year of uni, I thought, well, my first year of uni, I did American football. That was going to be the thing that I did sort of recreationally. And yeah. then I was really, really bad at it. I did it for a whole year and was just awful at it for a whole year. And, mm. um, and then my second year of uni, I said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start doing comedy again. So, I've been on the circuit properly for only about two years now. But um, I did get kids gigs. I was, a, I guess you could say, I was a children's entertainer for a long time. Yeah, right. I mean, that must be. It's kind of different, I guess. As a kid, what kind of are you doing? Like jokey jokes, as as opposed to. <laughs> I did a. Uh, my my big finisher, my big joke was I had this joke, uh, anything with toilets and like, right. food, they love it. So I had my bit, my big joke was about how like on perfumes, it, it says, it says, well, it says, oh, the toilette, right? But I, I, the joke is that I think it says, oh, the toilet, right? <laughs> and the joke was literally just me saying it over and over again. And the punchline was like, oh, I'm going to bring out like a lotion line called Yuck the Fart. And it always killed. I, don't, it, I, I wish I could do it at adult gigs, but um, that was, oh my God. Back in the day, I used to, I used to murder rooms with that. <laughs> and the audience are like uh, kids as well, is it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Kids yeah, yeah. and the parents. That's amazing. So did you do, actually do loads of gigs when you were around seven or seven and eight? And, uh... I would do like... No, I would do like like a gig a year or something, and then I do oh. I do like a sh like I do I go up for Edinburgh, do a couple of shows in Edinburgh. Yeah, didn't really do comedy properly because for so you think you're funny, you're only supposed to be going for one year. But I mm. sort of when they when they asked me about comedy club because I was like, well, I didn't really. I was like, it wasn't you know it wasn't like being a comedian really. No, come on. You're seven. It it's not like you're driving around the country. Right. Uh, yeah, with, yeah. with four other seven-year-olds. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a different thing altogether. But uh, I didn't know about this. So do you do those gigs now as well for kids? So, so it's adults and then a couple of kids as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm the one uh, kind of alumnus that still does them. So I've been, yeah, 
if you count those years, I've been doing comedy for uh, 14, longer than me, probably. 14 years, yeah. If you don't count them. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. And so you got back then, and uh, but in school, were you doing drama, that kind of stuff, like you know, performing in 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 another way? Yeah, I was. I loved I loved acting when I was at school. I think I always wanted to be an actor, and then I wanted to. Then I started writing plays, and I wanted to be a, uh, a writer because um, I'd write plays at school, and they were oh. always like they would always like take the piss out of the school. So I did one. I did <laughs> I did a play called. Um, Barry Potter and the EPQ of Fire. And it was like a Harry Potter parody, but we had to do this thing at school called the EPQ, which the most, was like the most ridiculous. It's this qualification where you write like an essay about something. Yeah. And so I wrote, a, I wrote like a, a Harry Potter parody that featured like all the teachers in my school and like the guy that worked in like the, the, the where the gyms were. And, mm. and I, did, I did another play uh, about like a group of nerds trying to uh, a group of math students who are trying to um, get with a load of girls that don't do maths they do like English they do like more humanities subjects I, I did a lot of st stupid stuff at school sounds good I presume you uh, were acting in them in these plays as well then. yeah yeah, you're, yeah, you're yeah. the main character, I guess. Yeah. Um, because I've seen that you were. In, are you into anime as well? Oh no, I'm not into anime. No. How come? Oh, I just, you just did a reference to Howl's Moving Castle on one of your tweets. There, I thought. I thought you were. Oh no! Yeah, I I got hammered and watched Howl's Moving Castle with my cousin the other night, and we were like, I I cried my eyes out. I was like, this is the best film I've ever seen. I watched it when I was a kid. I love that film, man. It's such a good film. It's a great soundtrack. It's just so beautiful, right? It's such a visually stunning film. It's amazing. Uh, I love it. I, I've seen it about three times, I think. But I went to see it at, two years ago, the Edinburgh Festival. One of the cinemas were doing a season of Studio Ghibli films. So I went to see it again with my daughter. She's, she was 18 at the time, I think. So um, I just love it. It's amazing. Amazing so, film. It's such a feel-good film. It must have been good to watch it on a proper cinema screen as well. Yeah, yeah. And we went to see Spirited, Spirited Away as well. Uh, have you seen that one? Yeah, see, everyone says that one's better, but I think House Women Castle's better. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's better. Uh, Spirited Away is much weirder, actually. Mm. Um, very weird stuff happens. Like this girl, uh, uh, her parents turn into pigs. And right. they're eating lots of food. They just turn into greedy pigs. Um, uh, that's not the weirdest thing that happens in that film, though. <laughs> um, it's just weird. Oh, what I love about How's the Moving Castle is that the whole idea that you spin, you know, when they go out the door, you just spin this thing and then you can go out into different places. I mean, yeah, that, I loved that as a kid. Just everything about it. The, all, all the characters are so well, so likable and... Mm -hmm. the, the the castle itself as well is so so well drawn in all the different it's rooms. Incredible. Um, legs yeah, and the yeah. fire, the fire that you have to keep feeding, or it's it's going. It's looking for more logs. It's such a fun, like creative film. And the director, yeah. the director said, Hayao Miyazaki said, like that was his favorite um, film he ever made. Like oh. everyone. Like Spirited Away is like the most um, has like the highest IMDb rating, but House Moving Castle is uh, is is his favorite. Have you seen that clip? We see there's a clip on YouTube where Hayao Miyazaki. It's quite funny. He goes to see his son's like uh, this first screening of his son's first film, and he goes in it like he goes into it like oh he's not ready like he shouldn't be making his film and he leaves it like halfway through and starts like chain smoking cigarettes. He's like, I knew he wasn't ready. Like this is, he's like so ashamed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a proper really? anime dad. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's looking at his own son's movie. Yeah, and he walked out of it. He walked out of it. Yeah. Oh my God. He looked too young to make his first film. He was like, no, it's not, not time yet. Oh my God, geez, I must have a look for that. Yeah, that's pretty harsh. To put that up online as well, that's pretty harsh for the song. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really brutal. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, so, uh, so then you started anyway. So you started doing a, a, at uni. What were you studying in uni? Uh, right. So I I applied. Okay. So one of my jokes is about how I how I applied for politics, but yeah, yeah. my the degree I, I ended up doing is uh, is actually French and Chinese. Oh, uh, it's, it's a long story. I basically got uh, I had to do an exam to get into uni. I go to UCL in London yeah. and I kind of messed it up a bit, but they were like, oh, you can go on this other course. And I didn't get the grades for that. So they were like, oh, you can go on this other course and you can do languages. So I ended up doing French and Chinese. Okay. Can you speak Chinese then? I can speak French. I can write, I can write Chinese and read it to mm. like, um, an, like a, a pretty base level. I, like I'm not amazing. Mm. But, mm. You know, as they say in Chinese, they say, they say man mandalai means like slowly, slowly come. Ah, okay. Mandalai. Yeah, because I was talking to, uh, actually I was talking to Patrick Healy about, he can speak a bit of French, right? His, his mother lives in Geneva, in Switzerland. So uh, I was asking him about doing a bit of comedy in French. He reckons he's not funny in French, actually. <laughs> uh, I, I did my year abroad in France last year. And I, I did some comedy in French. I think he'd be great. At it. I think he's done a French gig before. All right. Yeah. He, well, what he said was is that he finds things funny in in French, but he's not he's not funny in French. So ba basically, he said he's a better audience member in French. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. But he also said that there's a, a, a apparently there's a big uh, Chinese comedy scene. Um, so. It's a big audience, so maybe just keep keep learning the Chinese, you know. <laughs> yeah, um, what's his name? Des Bishop. When yeah, I was, I was telling him about Des Bishop. You know Des, do you? I've never met him, but I'm a big fan. Right, yeah, he went out there for a whole year, learned Chinese, and uh, he even went on a dating show. You know that one where there's like loads of girls standing around, one guy no, comes wait, he went on. He went on Chinese Take Me Out. Yeah, Chinese take me out. Yeah, that's a crazy show. That's a, such a funny. It's amazing what they say on there. Like how how just blunt they are. Like there was an American guy who went on there, and he was like in the video where he talks about himself. He was like showing off his passport. He was like, "If you get with me, think about all the think about all the possibilities with this passport." <laughs> they loved him. Right. Yeah. So yeah, he went on that. I think he went on a date. Yeah, I think he probably went on a date. I can't remember. But uh, I believe Chinese comedy is very blue. Like, they love um, sexual stuff. Really? But probably steer clear of criticising the government. It's all vetted. <laughs> I think every set you do that's broadcast on TV is, is, is vetted by the government beforehand. Oh, that's yeah, yeah. They're doing that now for... Like I've been over there. I was over there years ago to to you know to do expat gigs. Um, mm. And at that time, you just was fine. Uh, you just went and did the gig. But now they're uh, they want to see your whole set written down. It's Xi Jinping. Yeah, so it's pretty strict. And uh, yeah, and I mean the last a few uh, was it last year or the year before I was over in Hong Kong, and I guess those gigs are gone now. So. Uh, Things are getting pretty strict over there. So, so anyway, sorry. Wait, let's get back to the point. You, uh, you uh, yeah, started the by Chinese government. This podcast, and we keep talking about China. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, you, so you started doing it on your your second year of uni. Yeah, you started back into stand up comedy. Um, was that in the uh, on the student circuit or? Well, we did. I started out. We did. Uh, we did like a student gig, and loads of students came. And those are probably my favorite gigs to do. If we, if we pack out a room with students and I can perform to just people, kind of my generation, those are easily my favorite gigs to do. But then mm. I started doing open mics because I didn't, I didn't really um, enjoy, I haven't really enjoyed uni in London that much. So my like, way to kind of get away from uni was just do open mics and just like mingle with, with that sort of community. So I, I was doing like four open mics a week 
and just like it's, it's like soul destroying right like do open mics in london for like four nights a week they're like three hours long and everyone's terrible and you've got to go to like far flung corners of of london and stuff to do them mm. um but I, you know I, I i put in the work in and and uh but you know long process of trial and error i eventually managed to like get together a, like a seven that was that managed to win yeah. the, the competition yeah that's really cool i actually like that there was a clip i saw of you doing stuff about uh societies and you in, in university that i really like <laughs> i haven't done that a bit for so long it doesn't really work at club uh at club gigs but uh it works for student crowds yeah i really loved it actually yeah but like yeah i guess when you're in the clubs it's it's a bit specific but i like your thing about men's rights we're men oh, right. and we're men and we're right <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so that's really good. So yeah, I guess you gotta then change your set a little bit to. To I, I understand what you mean because when I, every comedian starts off uh, kind of uh, playing to their own peers or their own like set of people who get what they're talking about, and then you gotta then you gotta leave that, and 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 you Definitely. realize oh shit, oh shit, nobody's nobody gets what I'm talking about because it's so specific, you know. But it's a shame that people do that because I was talking about this with Patrick the other day. When I started writing, I was writing like, I was writing like really like stuff that I found really funny, like abstract stuff. Cause I was right, thinking about writing it for like me and my friends, not thinking about writing it for a particular circuit. But now I'm going, I'm writing my material with like a club setting in mind and I write different stuff. And it's not as weird as the stuff I used to write. And Patrick and I were saying that it's a shame that we, we kind of it's like the circuit sort of changes the way you write yeah i actually think though if, if if you with experience you learn how to bring you know bring the weirder stuff in and make it funny for everybody yeah yeah I just, right. yeah i just think you, you you just i think it's because I, i'm just sort of intimidated by that by doing these gigs that before seemed like so uh prestige to me but now uh right yeah i don't feel at home yet on, on those stages right right and so do you feel that like you you kind of are writing for that audience then rather than writing for yourself which yeah i think so i think so right yeah interesting so how did the uh how did this so you think you're funny um winning that how did that affect what you were doing did did that open a lot of drawers for you? Um, yeah, it did actually. I got, cause I got an agent through it. Um, right. and yeah, I, it was, it's, it was, it was, uh, yeah, it changed everything really. Um, I got an agent through that and then unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, I mean, I had my year abroad as, as soon as I finished doing Edinburgh, I was the next month I was supposed to go to France and, 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 and live there for a year. Mm. And um, and I almost thought about not going, and just and just uh, like taking a break from uni or whatever and doing comedy, but I'm glad I went. Um, but it, it, I, I've ta I've taken kind of a long break from gigging regularly because because I was in France and I, I I came back a bit and I did like a few weeks of like doing big clubs. Like I did comedy store for the first time. I was doing like up the creek and I was I was on like like backstage with like my heroes basically and mm. then uh and then everything sort of sh sort of shut down so th i think since so you think you're funny i haven't really had a chance to kind of like get momentum yet yeah like when when's the last live gig you did oh wow it was no it was i know what it was it was the boat show because people would start doing jokes about corona Darren yeah. Harriet was doing some jokes about Corona, yeah, uh, and I think I even did a couple as well. It was yeah, it was the it was the boat show, and then I went back to France after doing it, and then within two weeks it was like things are getting out of hand. I've got to come, I've got to come back. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so weird. Like I I it my last gig I think was the, around the fourteenth of March, yeah, and. Um, and then a couple of gigs started being postponed. But I, I look back on the messages 
I said, I went, oh, well, I suppose in a, in a few weeks, it'll be all over and we'll get back to normal in <laughs> three weeks. You know, I was so, I just thought, ah, it's just going to last three weeks and that's it. And uh, now it's completely changed. I mean, I don't see, if, you know, it could carry on for another, f well into next year. So it's really weird. I mean, I don't know. It must be really frustrating for you because you just start, it was just taken off for you. Well, I think I'd be more frustrated if, if I didn't, uh, if I was still doing mics and if Edinburgh hadn't gone that well for me, I think I'd been, I was very lucky, I think, actually. Mm. And do you think you can write, can you write for stand up, even though you know you're not doing any gigs? It's definitely harder. I think yeah. the, time, the times I feel most productive are when, after I do a shit gig and I come back and I think I'm, I'm like, oh, damn, I really wish I'd, I really wish I'd killed there and, I, and I'll try and write some more stuff. Um, I, I still have a lot of material that I haven't tested. So it feels weird for me to like write loads just because I wrote so much in France and I just didn't have a chance to do any like new yeah. material. Like so I've got yeah. loads of stuff that I haven't tested. I can't wait to just like do some more open mics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's how you would try out new material then. So you, like say if you've got a set, obviously, you want to do well in the prestige clubs, so you're not going to just try out new material there, right? So you just go go back to an open mic to try it out. Yeah, I'll yeah I'll do I'll yeah yeah yeah. Um, that's pretty much that's pretty much what I'll do. Or like there'll be like a new material night somewhere. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And so who who were your heroes when you were? looking at comedy before you did it like what kind of people influence you oh man i have so many though i have so many i mean i i used to just like i still am but i used to, i just love comedy so much as a kid and i think I, like when i was when, when i was really young i used to have it on cassette so i used to have comedy on cassettes and i used to yeah. listen to like, steve martin every <sighs> night and i used to listen to what else did I have? I had like all of Blackadder on a cassette and I had like, just like, oh, like old school comedy and I'd listen to them again and again and again. And then I'd watch like stand up on YouTube and then I'd see like people, like, people, you know, specials and stuff. I'd watch people doing specials. I actual comedians that like really inspire me. So I've got a list. I've got a list. I'm going gonna, gonna to just check my list. Okay, sure, yeah. I can't believe you were actually listening to cassettes. I thought you were too young for that. Yeah. <laughs> it was just, I, I think I had them for a while after people stopped, like after they became, uh, after people stopped yeah. using cassettes, I still had a little cassette player. No, when I was very young, though. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you were actually listening to, listening to the Black, to Blackadder. Yeah, I'd listened to a lot of, uh, I remember watching Blackadder was the first time watching Blackadder for the first time and thinking oh there's actually visuals to this it's crazy yeah you serious so you just heard it first yeah 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 it works you don't need the visuals really really yeah no wow yeah. that's interesting yeah, I must have a um, list yeah I've got I've got my little list here yeah. um so I like I, I get inspired by people for different reasons like I'll get inspired by the way they write or the way that they like put together a show um, or the way that they are on stage. So like, I th or like the way they do crowd work. I think Alex Edelman is really good at, yeah. um, at putting together a show and having, and like being a, like a big personality on stage and writing. I think he's like such a good all rounder for me. I think um, he's kind of, he's kind of young as well. Um, mm -hmm. Joke writers, I think, I really like uh, Carl Barron, I think is really good. Um, mm. I think uh, Jim Jeffries' older stuff, I think was really what? sick. Um, and uh, there's a lot of people on, on like, on this, like, uh, Tony Law. I think oh, so Tony Law, yeah. I gave you him years ago, and uh, yeah, he's incredible. I mean, he's just doing such weird stuff and i know we struggled a bit at, at the beginning like probably similar to what you're saying there he he uh when he started doing the jongler circuit he going ah they're not going for my weird stuff you know 
and uh, but he just like, he just kept, he persevered, you know. Like the bit where he puts, uh, I feel like every gig I've seen him do, he'll start. He puts the microphone inside his mouth, and then he pretends he's a foghorn and he pulls the foghorn and he he goes on. Mm, mm. it's, it's so funny. <laughs> yeah right yeah I wonder if you'll still be putting his mic or mouth around a microphone like post COVID uh, you'll have to bring your own microphone now if you're going to do that probably um, but uh, yeah so there are the people who influence you and, and is that do you look so you look at structure or, or how, how people deliver I mean interesting because you like Steve Martin is so physical as well um, yeah. it's a completely different I love Steve Martin absolutely love him amazing when he when he started out but it, i remember him struggling with the idea or he says in his book i think the idea that oh i can make my friends laugh but i wish i could get an audience to laugh like i can get my friends to laugh and uh he uh he he did do that he strove to do that though but uh and it's 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 a struggle that everybody has i think you're just trying to go why can't i get my you, you want the audience to be like your mates and then everything. Get, it's so funny, I get the opposite thing. I think, oh, I can get an audience to laugh. Why can't I get my friends to laugh? Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, God. And do you find that you, uh, you find that uh, seeing, seeing some of your heroes are working with them closely, like live, that you learn from watching them in person as well? Or do you, do you learn oh, more? For sure. For sure. I saw, uh, I did a gig with uh, Daniel Kitson. And, oh, yeah. uh, and the way that he controls a room is, is incredible. I just, mm. I aspire to that level of, uh, of kind of like, the, the, like he just looks so comfortable. Uh, and he, I saw him up the creek, which is a huge kind of, it, you're almost surrounded. It's just the back wall, right? Mm. And um, oh, just, just, just the way, it was, it was really like he was conducting an orchestra the way that he, um, he controlled the room. It was amazing. Yeah, he's, he's absolutely amazing. Incredible. I mean, he's so good. It, he just makes it look easy. It's almost dangerous watching him. You think, ah, it's easy. <laughs> 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 and, and then you go on and try the same thing and it's, fuck, I oh, know it's not that easy. Yeah. So, like every, oh, go on, go on, go on. Sorry. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. I was just going to say, every, every time I see a comedian do something and I think, oh, I don't know if I could do that, I always try and understand. I'm like, what's the what's the brain process that they used to get to that joke? How did they do that? I think I, I watch comedy quite analytically since mm. I started doing it. And do you uh, record your own shows and listen back every time? Yeah. Really? Wow. Yeah. And I, I, every time I do it, I'll, 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 I well, not every time, but most times, I'll, whatever, I'll, I'll, cut, I'll cut the weakest laugh. Oh, and then right. next time I'll do it, I'll put in a new joke, see if it gets a bigger one. Oh, all right. Nice one, nice one. But listen, thanks for coming on. And uh, every guest we've had on here, I've asked to recommend an act that maybe people don't know uh, that inspires you or that you think is amazing. So do, I wanted to recommend, uh, I wanted to recommend Mamoon Elagab. Oh, uh, I think somebody else has actually re re recommended. Him I wouldn't well. be surprised. Yeah, he's, amazing. he's a great, he's a good friend of mine. He's uh, he does he he does jokes about kind of what it's like to uh, talk to like woke white people as a black guy, and it is, he's very much my generation, and uh, he's he's gonna be he's gonna be big. Yeah, I actually think I'm set up to talk to him. So uh, I, I'm pretty sure maybe Charlie. Do you know Charlie George? Yeah, yeah. Uh, she was in my so you think you're funny final. Oh, was she? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's really good. And uh, I think she recommended Mamoon as well. So there you go. But that's fantastic. Thanks for that. And listen, thanks for coming on. And uh, I hope this flipping virus uh, just dies out soon so you can get back on stage. Oh, likewise, man. I hope, I hope we both get back on stage soon. Uh, it, was, it was thanks for having me on. It was great. It was oh. oh, brilliant. No, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Okay, we'll see you, Finlay. Yeah, man. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.